One of the things that we can turn to during times of confusion is the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us through the noble words of the blessed messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. During the end of times, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that one of the signs will be confusion. People will be confused. So when we live in a time where we see confusion and we see other signs of the end of times, the Prophet sallallahu said that murder and killing will become rampant. And we see that. That leaders will be put up as puppets and they will be the worst of people will become the puppets. Asfalun nas, the sufaha, the foolish people, the fools and the, and the, and the, the lowest of society will be begun to be put as the leaders of the people. And the people will come to the Ummah, the Prophet وسلم, and all of the non-believers will eat and split up the resources and the wealth of the Muslims like people picking from a plate. We see that happening. We see these sanctions and the embargoes that crippled our brothers and sisters in Iraq. That the Prophet وسلم, foretold in Sahih Muslim that there will be an embargo, there will be sanctions on Iraq and Syria. And we witness those. So we have no doubt as Muslims that we're living at the end of times. We know that the first sign of the end of times was the Prophet He said that he was sent. Between him and the end of times are like two fingers. That close. Now when we read those hadith about the end of times being near, it's not that we become apocalyptic and think that it's going to happen tomorrow. And it's especially important that we don't set a date to it as some apocalyptic cults from both within the Muslim community and outside the Muslim community begin to do. Oh, on October of this year, the world is gonna end. Or at 1500 years, the Ummah will end. Recently, somebody sent me a, uh, a message and said, oh, have you heard such and such Shaykh? He calculated out that the Ummah will only be 1500 years old. And I responded to him, I said, first of all, any calculations that give an exact time to the end of the Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, the, which also signifies the end of the world, all of those hadith, ahadith are uh, not, uh, not uh, those calculations are not to be counted on. That's not something that we know for a fact. Because if we feel that we know when the world will end, then how can we say it's from the knowledge of the unseen? How can the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell Jibreel Alayhi Salaam when he asked him when is the end of times? He said the one being questioned doesn't know more than the, the questioner. Both of us we don't know. It's from Ilm al ghayb It's from Mafatih al ghayb from one of the five matters that only Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows. So how can we have people that will put a date to the end of times? When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us nobody knows it except Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So we don't want to fall into that. And then I said second of all, the reason why you shouldn't concern yourself with all these calculations of when exactly the world will end is because the purpose of studying the end of times is not to become so frightened and become more confused. It's so that you focus on what you need to do. So the three questions that we should ask ourselves when we understand or when we read about or when we hear about the end of times, Akhir zaman or Asharat al-Sa'a, the signs of the end of times. The question is, why should we study them? And the question, then the question is, what are they? And then the third question should be, what do we do? What do we do? The first two questions in terms of what they are and why we study them, in a foundational hadith that every single Muslim should know, and that we should teach our children from a young age, and we find it at the beginning of Noah's 40 hadith, the hadith that's called the hadith of Jibreel a.s. But not just to teach it and, oh, here's a story, but to look at it as guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us on the lips of the blessed messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who was given what is called jawami'ul kalim, comprehensive words. Oceans of understanding can be understood from a few words of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said that one-fourth of Islam can be traced back to the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Three words. Three words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you can trace one-fourth of the understanding and the rules and the laws of Islam back to this hadith. That's because he was given so much power and eloquence in his words that no other prophet was given. So when we look at his words, it shouldn't be just we're looking at a uh, like we look at a, a, a Twitter feed, or we look at a Facebook post, 
Or sometimes we have Facebook sages that want to put up their Facebook hikam in a few letters or a few words. We don't read the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam like that. We read it realizing in huwa illa wahyun yuha that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us re revelation through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he was given jawami' al-kalim. So when we find Jibreel alayhi salam asking the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam four questions. He said, what is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? And when is the end of times? When is the, the sa'a, the final hour? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam responded by mentioning the five pillars of Islam and the pillars of faith and what exactly Ihsan is. But what I want to focus on is this last question because sometimes we don't. Sometimes when we look at the books, when they teach the deen, they just look at our faith, our practice, and then the inward perfection and the outward perfection of those two things, those three. But the hadith mentions four. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this was Jibreel, came to teach you your deen. He came to teach you your deen. So the deen is not just in those three, it's also in knowledge of the final hour and the signs. So Jibreel salam asks the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when is the final hour? He says, nobody, uh, essentially, only Allah knows. You don't know and I don't know. He said, Jibreel salam then said, then what are the signs? And he mentioned two signs. That the slave woman will give birth to her master. And that the poor, destitute, and unclothed shepherds will compete with each other to build tall buildings. The first one. The slave, the slave will give birth to her master. They said a literal meaning of this is that eventually there were many people who were slaves and they were, they were brought into the ummah and they, gave, they, they, they got their freedom through giving birth to people that, without going into all of the details, that's a lengthy discussion. The, the non-literal interpretation is that authority will be inverted. So for example, the slave woman, how is she giving birth to her master? She's going to give birth, she's going to bring somebody into this world that's now going to control them. One of the understandings is we find this in the way that people have lost respect for their parents. The parent who brought you into the world, now you become their master. Speaking to them in a disparaging way, in a foul way, yelling at them, cursing them, treating like them like a slave. And that's a sign of the end of times. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ruquq will become rampant. Disrespect of parents will become rampant. So that's one thing. Those were two signs. The other sign, or that was one sign. The other sign is that the poor, destitute, barefoot shepherds will compete with each other to build tall buildings. What do we see in the Gulf today? People who yesterday did not have oil and gas and their economy, like in the United Arab Emirates, was based on livestock and pearl diving. Livestock, the shepherds. And then the hadith says, they're unclothed. And if you see, I one time saw a picture of what the pearl divers used to wear. Very few, imagine what a diver is going to wear, just going uh, without any scuba gear when he's going to go to, to dive for the pearls. Barely any clothes. So an economy who yesterday, just 50, 60 years ago, was based on sh livestock and pearl diving, the barefoot and unclothed shepherds, now they're competing with each other to build tall buildings. They're not building tall buildings. The hadith says, doesn't say building tall buildings, it says competing with each other. Our building is taller. No, our building is taller. So we see this. So what is it? Why do we do this? Why should we learn these uh, ashraq al sa'a? The first thing is that it's mentioned by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a part of our deen. Knowing the signs of the end of time, it's a part of our deen. And what it builds in the believer is awareness of your surroundings and awareness of your time. Because it's not just enough for us as Muslims to say we have the Book of Allah and we have the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's sufficient for all ages. It's true. That's definitely true. But we can't stop there. We have to look around us and we have to see what is going on in our lives and what's going on in our society and what's going on with our community, our portion of the Ummah of, the Muhammad, of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then apply our deen accordingly. Apply our deen accordingly, not compromise our deen. 
We're sticking to the principles of the Quran. We're sticking to the principles of the Sunnah. We're sticking to what has been laid down by our, the early generations of the Salaf and the scholars. We're sticking to those principles, but we know how to apply it to our times. And I'll give you an example. Recently, somebody sent me a text message, or I was on a text message group, and they said, be careful when you're discussing on WhatsApp, because on the, the generic wallpaper behind it is a little picture of a dog. And sometimes we discuss a hadith in Quran, and now it's being fed on this wallpaper that has a picture of a dog. I said, first of all, this is ridiculous. Because from a fifth aspect, there's nothing wrong with reciting Quran live, and there's a dog a few meters away, or a few feet away, or right next to you. As some of our teachers, if they were eating a meal outside and a dog passed pass by, they would feed the dog. And there they are, a few feet away from it. And if you recite Quran, your molecules and the vibrations of your recitations, you're connected to that dog by the air, by the air, by the molecules. You have a connection. So if I have a connection live to this dog and there's nothing wrong with reciting Quran when a dog is uh, around, then why? Can, what's 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 the whole purpose of having a fatwa that says you can't have these discussions on WhatsApp? Second of all. Is that really what our time is about? If you're afraid, as the fatwa mentioned, this little fatwa postcard fatwa, <laughs> said people are using their phones and they have to make sure that they're using their phones for goodness and look what they're doing. I said people are doing a lot more foul things with their phones and we don't have to go into all of the details of what people are doing foul with their phones. So if you want to address the foul issues, the societal ills that are connected to handheld smartphones in our society, deal with those issues. Deal with illicit issues of, uh, illicit pictures of children. Deal with human trafficking. Deal with drug deals. Deal with hookup acts and kick and tender and all of these other apps that are people are using for khazu, for foulness. Deal with those issues and forget about a simple non-relevant issue that even from a fifth aspect has no uh, standing in our society. But when we don't look at our society and we don't realize what we're living in and the reality of the times that we're living in, then we'll get caught up in these other issues, these non-important issues, and argue amongst ourselves on non-important issues. And then I, find, I ended the conversation, I said, and tell the group when they figure out how many heads are, how many angels are on the head of a pin, to let me know that as well. Because in the early centuries of the Christian theologians, they also they got to a point where they were arguing about, well, how many angels could fit on the head of a pin? Nothing relevant to a person's life, to their aqidah, to their fit, to their practice, to their spirituality. And when people got so far from reality, look at what happened to their communities. They began leaving the church. And this push towards atheism didn't start today. And it didn't start yesterday. And it didn't start with the late show, famous late show host who are proud of their atheism and trying to push it on all faith communities. It started hundreds of years ago as people started moving away from the church. So we have to be aware of our surroundings and know what we're living in and the realities of the times that we're living in. Not to where we go to the extreme of thinking that it's going to end tomorrow and so we become in a state of despair, but also so that we don't go to the extreme of not even caring about it. If we really felt that this was the end of times, and the ashraf of sa'ah, the signs of the end of times, are occurring and manifesting themselves on a daily basis, would we really be caring about what's on a WhatsApp group and any other non-important uh, issue that we can think of? We have to be aware of our times. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, they said they were, from the guidance of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes he would make the appearance of the, j the jal seem so imminent they thought he was right around the corner. And at other times, they felt he would never come. Now, what does this do for the believer? It puts them in a state of balance. When you feel, when you get too comfortable with the times that you're living in, then move to those ahadith to talk about the Dajjal and make him seem imminent, his appearance imminent, so that you can move towards the center. But if you become too apocalyptic and think that the world is going to end tomorrow, then bring yourself back from the despair by looking at I could live another 50 years. We don't know the Ummah can go for another 10,000 years. There's nobody that came and said, it's going to end at this time. So, but we can move back. We can say, it could happen tomorrow. One of the things that happens on Yom Al-Jum'ah is that all creatures on the earth are silent in anticipation of the Nakh Fissur, because it will happen on a Jum'ah, on a Friday, except the Thaqala, except for the humans and the jinn. We're too caught up in our experience of this, the illusion of the dunya, and we don't realize it could happen today. But the animals realize that. 
and they have uh, a, a, a sense of uh, the, this perception that it could happen today, and we can move towards that. The way we do it is by understanding the signs of the end of times, reading the signs of the end of times, recognizing that it could happen. It could happen in our lives. It could happen in our lives, but it could also happen a hundred years down. But that whole process of going back and forth gives us a perception. You have to know what's going around in your times. If you just read the books and just read the ahadith, and the ahadith says, oh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this and this and this. Well, how would we know that it applies to our day in life if we don't have an understanding of the society that we're living in? So we can't just live in a bubble. The ulama have said for this specific reason, the ulama have to write books every single generation. Every single generation. Because the ulama will write books that respond and address issues in their times. One of the scholars, contemporary scholar, I have a, a great deal of respect for him. He brought on a student and the first project that he gave him was he said, go around my library and make a note of every book in my library, the topic and the age that it was written in. And then start doing an analysis. Look at what the ulama did. Because if you don't see that happening, if you don't see the ulama writing that, then we might pull a book off the shelf that was written in the 5th or 6th century. And then make a whole movement to try to say that this author and his understanding is going to be applicable in our times. And if we just go back to that book and that paradigm and those teachings, we'll be fine. And that's the wrong understanding. The ulama of every generation have to analyze their times and either say, read this book, it applies to our times, or make a new book. Review, revamp that curriculum so that it's pertinent to our society. That's the duty of the ulama. What's the duty of, uh, of every single one of us? Every single one of us has to be aware of our times. I'll give you one example. Parents raising their children in modern society. If a parent raises their child in modern society and does not know the movies that they're watching, and does not know the music that they're listening to, and even if, without going into the fifth debate, if you don't want to listen to the music, then read the lyrics. Read the lyrics of the music that your children are listening to and see what they're talking about and understand the, the, the singers and the people who, who are those people that are, that are making those uh, lyrics. Understand about them. But if you just say, oh, it's okay, he's just listening to some music, some harmless music, you don't understand, you don't have a perception of his reality. Do you understand the reality of the movies that they're watching and the messages that are coming in through those movies and who the actors are? If you don't want to watch the movie, read the transcript or read the synopsis, but be a part of the reality of your children that are being raised in this society. Do you realize, do you understand all of the apps that are out there on the phones that you give your child? For khair, it could be used for khair, but it could also be used for a lot of evil. And even if you have devices to monitor and lock, they have the, 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 young, the, the youth know how to unlock those and cover up their, their tracks. So do you know what's going on in their iPhone that they're using? Do you know the forums that they're, they're, they're going on? Do you know what's going on? Do you know what is around us in our society? That's the struggle of each and every single one of us. We have to have a perception of the world that we're bringing our children up in. And don't just say, Tawakkaltu ala Allah. The Qiyamah could be a long ways away. The Jad could be a long ways away. And Tawakkaltu ala Allah. I, to, uh, I, I depended on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say to the Bedouin when he came in? And he didn't tie up his camel. He said, why don't you tie up your camel? He said, I'm depending on Allah. He said, A'qilha wa tawakkal. Tie your camel and then depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So understand the reality that your children are living in. Understand the friends that they have at their schools. Understand the books and the novels and the, and the social media that they're exposed to. Understand all of those things, then depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you have to have a perception. We can't just go through thinking, I'm Muslim and then everything will be fine. We have to be active, we have to be proactive, we have to be a part of our children's lives, we have to be a part of the society that we're living in, and not just live in a time before us. Otherwise, we will make the mistake of not only not knowing the signs, but then of becoming one of the signs of the end of times. And that's the other reason why we learn the signs of the end of time, so that we don't become one of the signs of the end of times. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man walah, ma ba'atha ya ibadullah, taqullah, taqullah wa yu'allimukumullah. Dear brothers and sisters, 
We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask peace and blessings be sent upon our noble messenger and our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I enjoin you and I enjoin myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, avoiding the prohibitions of Allah outwardly and inwardly and fulfilling his commands outwardly and inwardly. We talked about why we should know the signs of the end of times. What are the signs of the end of times? But now what do we do? What do we do? When we see those times manifesting themselves, when we see the foolish people becoming the leaders, when we see our, our countries becoming divided, when we see the people becoming divided, when we see bur uh, bloodshed and murder becoming rampant, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Haraj, Al-Haraj. And the Sahaba said, what is that? He said, murder, killing. To where the point the person doesn't even know why they're killed. We see the images on the TV. Officer, why did you shoot me? I don't know. Literally, they're saying the same things that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said will happen. People will not know why they're being shot. And we're seeing that happen. Are we just going to go by in our daily lives? Are we going to become apocalyptic and say, oh, now the solution is we have to move to another country. The end of times is for the whole earth. You can go to a Muslim country, Muslim majority country. You can stay here. It will find you. The Dajjal will find people even in the remotest parts of the desert. It says in the ravines of the mountains in the desert that the Dajjal will be there. His system will be there. He knows what people will be doing. He'll track, be tracking everybody. And with smartphones now in the remotest parts of the desert, we see the system that's going to precede the Dajjal. But what do we do? We go to a hadith, and I first heard this hadith from my father, may Allah have mercy on his soul, and which reminds us his parents, teach your children hadith. And teach your children the, the, the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't know what hadith is thick. But this hadith that I first heard from my father helps me stay balanced in these confusing times. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in a hadith related by many including Ahmed, إِنْ قَامَتْ عَلَىٰ أَحَدِكُمُ الْقِيَامَةِ وَفِي يَدِهِ فَسِيلَةً فَلْيَغْرِسْهَا If the day of judgment comes upon you and in your hand is a baby palm tree, a, a sapling, then plant it. Then plant it. Go ahead, complete what you started. Complete what you started. One way to look at this hadith is that it's a figure of speech. Because if the qiyamah happens, when the mountains are, are being turned into look what looks like wool, and the skies are falling, and everything is, is, is now over and cracking, and the world is coming to an end, no one will be in a state of mind. They will be so scared that they can even complete an action that they were doing. So some of the ulama said, we take this as a figure of speech. What it means is that if the end of times is imminent upon you, then continue working. Because you don't know who's going to come after you. One time Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu saw an older man. And he said, why aren't you, a farmer, he said, why aren't you, why didn't you plant? He said, I'm old and I'm going to die any day. There's no point. I'm not going to eat from my crops or from the trees, the orchards that he plants. He said, but there are people that could come after you that could benefit from that. He said, I implore you to finish your farm. And Umar and the farmer both, with both of their hands, continued the farm. I learned this lesson one time firsthand from an old man, the first person that I studied Quran with, the first person that I studied with in West Africa. And he was at his date palms and a younger student from the state said, he said, Sheikh, you're very old. Why are you planting new palm trees? You're not going to benefit from them. He said, yes, but my children will come after me and benefit. So there are things that we're doing. We can't become in such a state of despair that we think nothing's going to happen after us. We have to continue things for the people that are coming after us. So we should not go into a state of despair with all of this confusion that is happening and all of the divisiveness that is happening and all the political turmoil that is happening say, oh, it's over, it's too late. No, plant the palm tree. Every single one of us has a palm tree in their lives that they can plant. Plant it because you could benefit from it. The people after you could come and benefit. The other understanding of this hadith, they said this is the power of having a sincere intention and doing things for the sake of Allah. Because when that person is planting that, that sapling, if he sees the end of times happening, as the literal understanding of that hadith is, he's going to complete it because he started this action for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he should finish it because whether or not it ends right then and there, he's going to get the reward for it. So finish your actions. But the important thing for us to remember is to do something. We have to do something. 
as the political turmoil is happening, as the divisiveness is happening, as the oppression is rampant and murder is rampant and whatever is happening and this, the morals of society are going down and down and down on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, each and every single one of us has to do something. Don't just be an armchair revolutionary, a Monday morning quarterback, a Facebook warrior and making posts about what's going on in the world. Do something. Each one of us should be doing something. When somebody asked me about a movement recently, I said, we could talk about the movements. We could talk about the movements. But I'm too busy actually doing things to help the people in those urban communities. I don't need to talk about the importance of doing it because I'm actually trying to do something. Yes, it's important to have awareness and build awareness. But once we've done our duty in building awareness about what needs to be done in society, pick something and do something. Each one of us has a God-given talent, has something within us, and we find this in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hadith about people are ma'adin like dhahab and fiddah. People are like gold and silver. But you have to have fiqh of Islam, understanding of Islam, not just fiqh, the science of fiqh, but the total holistic understanding of Islam and bring that out. And each, every single one of us can offer something to our society to our families, to our friends, but we can't just be takers from society and getting our job and our 401k and our children are in the best of colleges and we got everything set up for us and we forget the rest of our society. We have to do something to be givers to our society that we're living in and we actually have to do something and continue doing that, especially when you feel like there's no point especially when you feel like the, the mountains are falling and the skies are falling. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, if the day of judgment falls upon you and in your hand is a fasila, a baby palm tree, that he should plant it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to understand where our fasila is, where is our palm tree, and to give us the tawfiq in these last confusing times to be able to, to plant it. And Ya Allah, give us clarity and give us understanding of the times that we live in. And Ya Allah, give us understanding of the signs of the end of times and make us from amongst the people who do something in these end of times. And not those of the people that talk about what needs to be done. Ya Allah, make us from amongst the people that are not from the signs of the end of times and protect us from all of the, the fitan, all of the trials of the end of times.